Ryan Atkins, welcome to the Single Track Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So you only recently came on my radar, even though you've been in the ultra endurance game in many different circumstances for years. Uh, this is primarily a mountain ultra trail running audience. So could you give us just a little bit of background on how you got into this scene and um, like how you've progressed over the years and like where your interests have taken you? Yeah, totally. Actually, um, I guess it would date back to uh, early 20s. I was um, racing mountain bikes kind of full time and uh, cross country. And there's this really cool trail in northern Ontario um, up in Killarney uh, Park and called the La Cloche Trail. And my buddy was telling me about it. It's not really cool, but you can't fight it. You have to run it. It's about uh, 50 miles. It's like total wilderness. So as soon as you start, like, you don't, you, there's no bail options until you finish. Um, just really cool trail. And I wanted to do it. So uh, I started running <laughs> for a few weeks and then we went and did it. And then it was kind of just from there, it snowballed in terms of like, yeah, doing more trails, doing more racing. Um, I guess I got into kind of ultra running there. And then um, from there, kind of went to uh, racing and just, yeah, FTTs and things like that. And one thing we're particularly interested in on this podcast is athletes like yourself that have either made the conscious decision to go full time or there's just been a lot of opportunities presented to them to go full time. And, and you're at that point where like, this is like your full-time profession. Like you live to train to get that last one to two to 3% of ability. Um, can you talk about how that came to be and like what you were doing before that? Sure. Totally. Uh, I was actually working as a design engineer, um, mechanical engineer. And, uh, that was cool. It, I mean, it was sitting at a desk, but it was a uh, pretty fun work. And, um, my friend told me that there was this obstacle race where if you won it, you would win a brand new ATV. And he thought that I might stand a chance at succeeding. So I went and I did the race and I won the ATV. And that was pretty cool because it was like $10,000 ATV. I sold it um, and uh, bought a mini excavator, started a trail building company. And then it was kind of like building trails, working engineering, racing. They were kind of all just like competing for my time. And, and then um, as I started doing more and more racing, uh, there was just like travel um, weekends where, you know, you'd leave on Thursday afternoon or you'd fly somewhere, do a race, and you'd be back, you know, at your desk on Monday, just totally um, exhausted and shattered. And after a while, I was kind of like, well... I can make more money racing than I can working and it's better anyways. I enjoy it more. So, um, uh, just jumped right in. So the scene you were in at the time, was it OCR? Cause I, my understanding is that in that sport and Spartan, et cetera, there's a lot more prize money, uh, on the table. Like by comparison, our big races like UTMB, Western States, et cetera. Like there's no prize money. Like if you podium at that race, your payout is going to come, when you sign a contract with some brand, but it's not going to come from uh, directly from the race. Yeah. So, I mean, obstacle racing definitely has way better prize money. Um, like I've won races where I've gotten $50,000 um, for, for the win and multiple times and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know why trail running has such little prize money. I think it's, um, it could relate to the fact that a lot of trail races have to cap their entries due to like, wilderness permits and stuff and so then they only have 500 to a thousand people doing a race and so the race organizers just literally don't have the money to put out um prize money i guess but yeah in like obstacle races it's not uncommon to have 10,000 participants in a weekend and you know a brand will do 20 30 40 you know plus weekends a year so it's um i think a lot more lucrative on the uh side of the race organizers wow so does that mean and again this is all new to me so i apologize if these are like entry level questions but <laughs> does that mean that there are more folks like you in the sport at the top end who are totally committed to doing it like full time um i don't know i'd actually say this might be less folks uh but the folks who are committed to doing it might be making i don't know like you said trail running is all about sponsorship and um some of those sponsors can be very lucrative um whereas like in 
obstacle racing, it's probably less so. So there's like less of a guaranteed income stream. Um, but yeah, I'd say it's I'd say it's a big mixture. Yeah. Again, this is <laughs> this is just, this is just fascinating to me. Like I think one like I always ask athletes in our sport, you know, why aren't you doing everything you can in your career to make this your one thing? Because I feel like if you're doing this full time, there's just performance advantages that you can get that you couldn't get if you were trying to balance it with like a nine to five or even a part-time job. Um, I'm curious if you think that that's critical to do. Like if, do you think that being full-time at this has been critical to your success or do you think that you would have had the same um, amount of success and prize money, all that kind of stuff if uh, you know, you were still building trails or in doing that other design work? I think that's a very weighted question because you can make it work. You can make working a job. Um, I mean, it's a lot easier if you were working a part-time job, you know, 20 hours a week or something, and then doing your training and your competing. Um, I think that's totally reasonable to work like a full-time job and train and compete. Um, also still possible, but it just means that like, you probably don't have time for a girlfriend and a family and like time for friends, things like that. If you want to actually, you know, succeed at the highest level um, or conversely, like you could do it for a while but then you might burn out. I think it's like kind of cool because when you're, when you're working full time and competing at a high level, it's almost like, it's almost like a badge of honor. And like, there's this kind of, uh, yeah, like this cool thing about doing that, that I think gives you strength and it gives you like meaning um, within your racing and within your training. Cause you're like, every second is more precious because you have less time. So like, mm. you're like, Oh, I've got an hour. I better make it count. Things like that. Whereas, um, like on paper, it's way better to be full-time athlete because yeah, you like do your training and then you can focus on your recovery and you can do things like that. But, um, yeah. So I think there's pluses and minuses to both sides of it. And but I do agree with you that like, it's a pretty awesome lifestyle. And uh, I think if someone has like the talent to do it, that it's definitely worth yeah. pursuing at like at some point in their lives. Well, not to jinx anything, but again, this is another common concern among top athletes in our sport, the risk of injury. Are you in a position where even if you got injured, for example, or you were dealing with like a couple weeks off, you have more like long-term relationships with brands so that you can afford to do that. And like, take the time to properly rehab and and get healthy for later in the year or in a subsequent year. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think COVID was a perfect example. Like we basically earned no prize money last year and, yeah. um, you know, we still had sponsors who uh, stuck by us and during the process and things like that. So um, that was awesome. So it's really helpful having like a, a combined income stream between prize money and sponsorship. Right on. What does it, what does a typical day look like for you? Like, about this time of year, because I know that you're a varied athlete. You do different stuff in the winter versus fall, spring, and summer. So, like, right about now, uh, what does a typical day in your life look like? Yeah, I mean, wake up uh, probably around 7 o'clock, 7.30, um, get up and have a big breakfast, uh, go over, like, some emails and stuff like that. And then I usually start training around 9, and um, most days I'll – bike i'll do like some training on the bike and some training on running um that's pretty typical i guess i probably bike six days a week and run four or five is like pretty average but then i'll yeah i usually bike for like about two to three hours and run for like an hour and a bit and then i'll do some strength training um about three times a week and that's mostly like injury prevention kind of stuff um things like that. And so after my first training, I come home and I have, uh, yeah, a smoothie and try to relax and, um, for a little bit before I go out again and do something else. And, um, yeah. And then, like, the, then it's usually like taking care of stuff around the house, like cutting the lawn, fixing stuff. Um, my wife and I own a Airbnb. Um, so like go over there, I was just over there installing, um, keypad locks, um, for those two units. So, uh, do stuff like that and then come back home and, uh, yeah, yeah, there's usually always something on the house. It's like, I really like 
bike so i like spend time working on my bike or like cleaning it or cleaning my wife's bike or doing stuff like that i usually spend like 20 or 30 minutes a day like <laughs> just tinkering with stuff and then uh then it's like time for dinner and we like watch an episode or something um as afterwards and uh go to bed it sounds like you're yeah it sounds like you're incredibly diversified like again the athletes i talk to they're like if i was a full-time athlete i wouldn't know what to do with myself i would finish my run and then i would just like sit on the couch and watch netflix all day but um you're painting a much different picture Yeah, there's always kind of something to do. Um, it's actually kind of funny how busy we really are. And especially like with all the, like we do race a lot too. So I think a lot of athletes, um, I think it's less common in trail running and ultra running to like to race so much. So then you would have longer blocks of time at home. But if you're racing, you know, weekend and then weekend, like you only really have like, monday to thursday like monday you get home and like you do some training you have like tuesday wednesday maybe thursday before you're like going somewhere else so it's like you still all your tasks and everyday life and emails and sponsorship obligations they all get condensed into like a shorter period of time so yeah it is it, it is a bit busy because you're a multi-sport athlete does that mean you can safely train like 30 to 40 hours a week as opposed to a runner who on a good week is limited to like 20 hours time on feet. Yeah, totally. It's amazing how little runners train, I think compared to cyclists. Yeah. And I come from a cycling background where it's like pretty normal to do 20 to 30 hours a week. So, um, yeah, I really enjoy being able to like boost my volume and just like keep it more interesting by mixing and cycling and in this, in the winter, um, skiing and like fat biking and stuff to, to the training. I definitely want to have a much bigger conversation about like your training philosophy later in the uh, conversation, but just a couple more <laughs> questions on this lifestyle front. What do you see as the pros and cons of, of your current lifestyle? Hmm. I think, I think pros would be just like having time to, I don't know, like explore like what you want to do. Like, uh, I don't know, like right now I'm like, sewing a frame bag for a friend and like that takes a fair bit of time and it's like but it's like something I enjoy doing or like I don't know just having like having this extra bit of time to like pursue other hobbies I guess and to uh yeah delve into that I think is really awesome and I think also that people make themselves so busy that they don't actually have any time to like to themselves and like reflect on things or even just like time to be like mixing, mixing, mixing. mixing. So I think having, um, having like the last lead, even though like I do, I also have periods of time where I'm able to like, I guess decompress and, um, look at the big picture and almost philosophize a bit, which I think is like pretty cool. Um, cons, uh, yeah, I think the con would be just having, well, I mean, it, you could see it as being pretty stressful because there's like, I don't think I find this because I've been doing it for so long and um, because we have like some great sponsors and stuff. I keep saying we because basically it's my wife and I are in like a very similar right. situation. Um, but I could see if you were like, oh, I'm going to rely solely on prize money and then you show up at a race and you're like, well, if I don't win i'm not gonna eat this week kind of thing <laughs> or things like that um so there could be that con to it um as well as just having a lack of like predetermined schedule um i like not having a schedule because i can kind of make my own and then prioritize like what needs to be done but i think some people kind of uh might not thrive on that they kind of need like structure to then like slot things into what advice do you have for fellow athletes who are new to this idea of being a full-time athlete, full-time endurance athlete uh, that are trying to make it in a similar way? Like they want to live some sort of version of what you've created. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, it's like really important to, uh, look at the big picture and kind of like see like what you want to do, how you want to do it and like plan ahead. It's kind of like a, 
it's like a problem it's like that you have to solve and so that solution might look like um spending time on your training spending time on finding like uh passive sources of income um just figuring out how you're going to make it work and uh that could mean yeah it could mean trying to become like more of an athlete influencer which i think today in today's like uh climate is very prevalent there's not a lot of people who are like just racing you know who have no um no presence online so it's like nurturing that and nurturing relationships and then just like yeah getting after it and making it work for you talk about where you're really advice but <laughs> yeah hopefully that helps <laughs> talk a bit just to close the book on your background to talk a bit about where you're based in quebec and why you choose to live there because again just i live in this west coast mountain west bubble where people think if you want to be like a serious multi-sport endurance athlete stuff like that you got to live in like boulder colorado or flagstaff arizona or you know somewhere in the mountain west where um maybe the weather conditions are more favorable year round so i'm just curious like why you've chosen to invest in that area of the uh of north america to live and train yeah um well basically we we are canadian so um it would be i guess we could get like special persons visas and like move to the us but um we don't have them so like we're in canada um so that limits you know flagstaff or boulder i guess we could move to victoria or somewhere like that um but yeah i mean most of canada has pretty harsh winters and uh but honestly um where we, we live in the eastern townships which is um like southern quebec uh just north of the vermont border and it's i don't know i love it here it's beautiful there's like amazing trails and dirt roads and it's like it's calm it's like relaxing and there's also i feel like in boulder or places like that there's just yeah this sense of like not only entitlement but also like like you said people who live there think that they're like that like i guess it's like the boulder bubble it's like that is the center of the universe according That's to right. them and it's kind of like refreshing to be somewhere where like you can just go out and like train and like everybody's super humble <laughs> and like there's people who crush out here but um i don't know they don't it's almost like more like a united front and instead of like ultra competitiveness within like that community so it's kind of like a refreshing in that respect too but yeah i guess the weather is like a bit harsher in the winter um spring kind of drags on for a while the roads are all like dirt around here so they just like stay um super muddy after like all the snow melts for a few weeks uh but i don't know it's like the ebb and flow of seasons is like always been i think like a advantage to training because it kind of like forces you to switch it up and to have like different focuses as you go along um yeah a lot of render runners get injured a lot so um it's nice to almost be forced into like different aspects of, of training yeah by the way it looks like you have a pretty sweet like home base set up like we're doing a video interview now and your your background looks pretty sweet i watched a video you and Lindsay have a pretty sweet gym set up too can you talk about how you've created this home base that's good for training as well yeah we live like kind of on top of the hill so our driveway is half a mile long and about 300 over 300 feet of vert to get up there so i mean that's pretty cool because like you can do hill intervals out the front door or you can uh after the end of at the end of every ride and run you kind of have this decent sized climb um to get home but then yeah we've got a gym we've got like a, a a bike with a smart trainer set up a squat rack a rower uh skier and then we've got like an overhead kind of rig with monkey bars and things that you can kind of hang on and do pull-ups um yeah, it's pretty set up in there, uh, all the stuff. And then we've got a sauna, um, just like steps away outside that you can jump into after. So um, I actually do, I do run on the treadmill, like when I'm transitioning fitness from like bike to, to run fitness, I find I use the, I find the treadmill is like really effective for that. Um, just because like you can run really fast on it and like work on leg turnover and things like that and not be affected by 
um, things outside. So I'll do like specific workouts on the treadmill. Um, as much as it sucks, even like sometimes when it's nice outside and I'm just like, I would much rather be outside, but it's like, I'll do my 45 minute workout on the treadmill and then I'll ride my bike afterwards outside. So, um, yeah, it's a great little setup we have here. And what's it like having a partner who's also one of the very best athletes in the sport? Yeah, it's great. It's nice to have somebody who understands like what it means to be, um, an endurance athlete and like the sacrifices that it takes and, and like the selfishness that it kind of involves. Um, so I think we're really good at kind of recognizing that and also giving each other, um, space when we need it to do the things that we need to do. It's like, Oh, I have a really hard day. I won't be able to make dinner. Can you do it tonight or things like that? Um, so yeah, it's great. <laughs> are you guys on similar training schedules year round or are you doing different things? Yeah, similar, but different. Um, our training looks pretty, pretty similar. Lindsay's focusing a little bit more on sky running, um, races this year, whereas I'm focusing a bit more on biking stuff. So she's running a bit more in the mountains, but, um, yeah, I'd say our training looks, looks pretty, pretty much the same. <laughs> right on. Well, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Spartan and the OCR scene and introducing this audience to it. Um, I know you have some gripes with it too. Like I think you've mentioned in the past that you got frustrated with how much more running has become involved in the races. Is that correct? Yeah. And I mean, it's not even just running. It's like, I guess the type of running, I think that to explain it to most people, um, like most of the racing, that I've done in the past has been basically like imagine a super gnarly uh, trail run or uh, like ultra course um, and then just like break it up with like these fun obstacles that you get to do along the way. So like we'll do or we used to do races that, you know, over 13 miles would have you know, 6,000 feet of climbing or more, um, and like off trail, like bushwhacking, running, um, scrambling, like all sorts of super fun running, like mm. really engaging. And then they've kind of like started to almost introduce more like flat courses where it's more like cross country running, more like <clears throat> just like <laughs> dirt roads and things like that. And it's just, uh, I don't know. To me, it's, I understand that like you can have a mixture of the two and like, um, try to find in, in, in trail running, it's the same thing. There's like mountain running and there's sky running and then there's like Variations trail running here. and then there's like super non-technical courses. Um, it's just like, I think that OCR was kind of like brought up on like having more technical, more challenging courses. And then, you know, obstacles that like you had to be good at doing um in order to make it through like um and they're kind of like getting away from that with like the intent of having like more people finish the average person be able to complete it um but i mean my argument is that like there's this north american elite series where like that's what i do it's got most of the prize money and i just think that they should like make those events more difficult and kind of showcase them instead of like trying to water down the entire sport. Yeah. What's their rationale for this watering down process? Honestly, I think it's just CEOs within the brand that, um, have it in their mind that like, if the events are hard, it'll scare people away and they're just trying to get people to sign up instead of trying to grow the elite side of sport. So it's kind of like there are people within the company that believe in, you know, elite competition and yeah. the athletes and like growing that. And then there's like this contrasting group of people who are just all about the bottom line. Um, and so they're always kind of fighting each other and there's no cohesiveness within um, their decisions. Which is interesting because if I understand correctly, the sport was born out of trying to recreate like the military training environments and like extremely harsh conditions and believing that people were going to, be attracted to that and want to like have that controlled experience in their life somehow. Right. Exactly. And like, that is the way it kind of was and somewhat still is, but there's also, and I think it's all 
people show up, they do an and um, yeah, some people don't come back, but some people get their like butts kicked, and then they're like you know, some in a year, and it changes their whole lives because now they have this thing that they want to accomplish. That's like, this full body uh, and mind challenge, and they like you know get really into it. I think is cool. Uh, becoming the easier places would kind of promote the one and done type of competitor um, instead of having like brand retention yeah can you also talk about i think it's relatively recent news um or at least they're contemplating it uh separating elite racers from like age groupers and back of the packers and the reason i ask is because one of like the cornerstones of mountain ultra trail running is that the elites and the everyday runner are on the exact same start line and there's something special about that and it sounds like you've talk about being in favor of this separation. So can you talk about why you think that makes sense in that sport? Well, actually it's, it is the way it is and it's been oh, it that is. Okay. way for a while. So, um, the elites go off and then the women go off and then 15 minutes later, the, they start going through age group, um, starts and then eventually they get to like the open waves. And, um, honestly it's having everybody on the start line is great, but, but, there's an issue with obstacles where you can only get so many people through an obstacle or otherwise there's like bottlenecking and that really sucks when you're like doing a race and then all of a sudden you get to an obstacle and you have to stand and wait for five minutes yeah so that's that's the reason why they do uh staggered starts um because if you have uh yeah i think they have the heats limited to about 250 people per heat and then um they just go off that way uh it'd be great i don't see any issue like morally or, <laughs> or like societally with having everybody start but it's just a logistics thing because like yeah the uh the bottlenecks are real and i've never been to one of these events which is why i have a lot of basic questions but you mentioned that like you can have like ten thousand athletes at an or multiple thousands of athletes at a given event does, are these taking place at like ski resorts or like where are these taking place that you can facilitate that many people and yeah 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 exactly a lot of the, like a ski resort is a popular um venue to have okay. sometimes it, uh anything that has access to the outdoors access to trails and uh, a ton of parking is basically okay. like <laughs> where they go what's the pitch in your mind to athletes in our sport that have uh have never dabbled in spartan or ocr yet I think the pitch is like, especially if you're a, a runner who also likes to um, rock climb or scramble or do things that aren't just like running around in circles on a track, then the like full body challenge and um, like coordination required is really, it's a lot of fun because you're not just like, yeah, there's a lot of running and the running's hard and like the running's fast, but it's um, it's broken up with you know, a rope climb or a heavy carry or, um, monkey bars, or it just has this element of play in it. Mm. Um, that's a lot of fun. We're always trying to brainstorm ways on this podcast to improve the sport and the culture, the business of trail running. Um, is there anything that you have experienced on the OCR Spartan scene that you think would be interesting or worthwhile trying out in our sport that's absent? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, like, what do you miss when you come over to the trail scene that you like get your fill of when you're in Spartan? And it could be it could be competition related. It could be the prize money, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, honestly, the obstacles. <laughs> when I do when I do a trail running race, I'm like super engaged, it's really fun, and then I'm just like running along, and I'm like. I could really like jump over a wall now or I could like just do something else for, for 20 seconds and then go back to the running. Um, it's because I get a little bored of just like of only running. Um, so that's kind of a funny answer that obstacles are the thing I miss. But um, yeah, I think that the, uh, I don't know. I think like it really depends on the trail race. Um, but I think, I think having like off trail sections could be like really fun where you're like where you're basically bushwhacking between trails to like link things up orienteering um, which is a lot easier to do like in uh in the east coast where stuff grows back like the next week and, like 
out west they try to stake on trails because you run somewhere and then it's a trail for the next hundred years but um yeah it's really fun when you're like just mobbing through the woods and jumping over down logs and uh brush and stuff like that i want to uh make sure we have a conversation about your training philosophy and how you approach sport um one thing interesting about our sport, and I'm sure you recognize this all the time, uh, everybody is like very narrow-mindedly focused on one discipline. Like if you're an ultra runner, you're running throughout the calendar year. There's not really any dedicated off season. Some people talk about it, but I think it's like mythical. Um, what do you think you miss out in that process as a high level athlete when you're just dedicated to one sport to the exclusion of everything else? Uh, I think you miss out on a lot of things. I think you miss out on, um, different forms or different streams of motivation. You miss out on, uh, like breadth of training approaches and things like that, because you can learn a lot from what other sports are doing and then take those nuggets to your training or to your sport. Mm. Um, I think you also like put yourself at greater risk of injury and you're missing out on, um, just like skill acquisition and like general fitness general like full body um yeah like competency because if you are only running then uh i don't know i think the human body is available like able to do a lot of different things and a lot of different kinds of motion and obviously like humans were made to run but uh we were also made to run on like through the woods and like off trail and things yeah. like that. And that by running on like really predictable surfaces for hundreds of miles, I think it's just, it's a little bit outside of what our bodies are meant to do. Do you think that like looking at your own example for a second, do you think given that you are committed to this multi-sport approach, do you think that you have like a, a longer shelf life as a elite level high performance athlete? Uh, yeah, I think so, actually. Uh, I think not only from, like, physical injury, but also from, like, mental burnout. Um, because, like, I'll get really excited about, um, racing bikes or about, yeah. uh, lifting weights or about something else. And it doesn't mean I'm not still running and I'm not still, like, doing the training. It's just there's, like, another, uh, focus introduced. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know there's got to be a genetic component to this, but um, you're not spending a crazy long time each year in any given sport. So how are you, what's your thesis on why you're able to perform at a high level across so many disciplines? I think my thesis would be to build um, a lot of aerobic fitness and then to apply that aerobic fitness like with the right stimulus at the right time, depending on what your goal is. So like, yeah. um, yeah. So like, say I was doing, I was training for the Iditarod, um, which I did on a fat bike in February, which was really awesome. But I was doing like a ton of, uh, ton of fat biking to get ready for that. And then after that, I had to like kind of switch to running. So I had like this really big base of like endurance, but I didn't have any kind of speed work and any, um, kind of running. So then I was just doing like a lot of running at like tempo and above, uh, on like the type of terrain that I was expecting to race on and, um, kind of like transitioning that fitness from, yeah, fat biking in the Arctic to like running trails in California, um, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Things like that. I, if I understand you're in your mid thirties at this point, still at the top of your game, what's been your experience at, at this point in your career? Uh, trying to capture those last couple percents of uh, performance gain in training? Like, what are you doing at this point in time, maybe that you weren't doing in your early 30s or your late 20s, uh, to stay where you are at sort of the top of the mountain? Oh, man, that's... Uh, I think, like, so much has changed um, in terms of, like, how I train, but also so much has stayed the same. <laughs> it's kind of like, I guess... Now I'm doing, now I have like, like, I guess you asked about my thesis before and like the way I see like running is it's kind of like, I was thinking about this the other day. I see running as like three pillars. You have like running economy, uh, you have, um, 
like aerobic fitness and then you have uh like technical skill yeah of like skill of running like how how you run downhills how you run uphills and things like that and like basically if you like break it down into those three facets you can kind of um you can kind of see how like to improve improve your economy and to improve your skill like you have to run but by running you are also like breaking your body down and so you can build your aerobic fitness other mm. ways um and so like i don't know if you like if you look at it that way you can kind of just like apply the right stimulus at the right time as your event is approaching and then prepare for it instead of just being like I need to run all the time as much as possible, um, things like that. And like, it's okay to have your run economy, like go way down because with the right stimulus, uh, you could bring it back up. And if you have a better aerobic base and better recovery, then when you do bring the stimulus back up, your body can handle more load in that period of time. Um, yeah. so yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> no, that makes sense. Well, one other question I had there, um, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that you race quite frequently and I'm curious, given that, how do you go about the process of constructing like a logical training block where, you know, I'm guessing to you peaking at certain times of the year is important and there's only so many times you can stay properly motivated to like go to the well. So how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, basically I only peak like once or twice a year. Um, but I try to hold a, like a relatively high level of fitness throughout the year. So like for like world championships or um, big events like that, I'll try to like set up peaks. Uh, but I guess I kind of like set up little mini peaks throughout the season for important races. And then I also just train through a lot of, a lot of events and races. Um, and that's, that seems, that's like what I've been doing for years. And I think there's an argument that could be made that like, I don't know, you were going to sacrifice performance at the high end by racing so much. Yeah. Um, but I think if you just have like one or two events that are really important, you can still do a lot of racing throughout the year. And then like, as that event approaches, you can tailor your fitness and your motivation and excitement towards those events. As long as you can switch off during less event, important events and um, kind of let your ego go a bit if you don't have a result that you kind of thought you should have and just like accepted this training. Yeah. Well, maybe you've already experimented with this, but, uh, so forgive me if I didn't do my, my research, but what do you think would happen if you focused on one sport to the exclusion of everything else for like a calendar year? I think if I had like a really big goal, I could do that. If like, I don't know, I thought about like, um, I think I could do like well at a race like UTMB or something like that. And if I like, did something like that, then that might be, I mean, one year is insane. I would never do that, but like maybe four or six months I could like hunker down and really have, um, a focus and yeah, I think it could go really well for me. Um, you're excited about big, UTMB. Yeah. I think it'd be a really good challenge, <laughs> but I also think that there's like this, you introduce this possibility of spending six months or a year preparing for an event and then you get a flu on your way there and you know that would really suck yeah. <laughs> so it's like i guess i love competing and i love training and i love just movement outside and i get so much joy out of that that like sacrificing you know a year of your time in your prime, what would that be? Like maybe five or 10% of your like prime, uh, physical ability, yeah. um, for one event. It just seems, it seems risky, but yeah. also exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just reminded of this now. I, I should have asked it earlier, but, um, like one thing interesting about our sport trail running is, uh, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's just interesting. There's a lot of like kumbaya in the sport. Like nobody is outwardly like expressing like rivalries with other athletes. It's not like, I don't know if you watched the formula one series on Netflix. Um, right. Yeah. I'm yeah. Cu I'm curious. Like, do you like in the, the world of like Spartan and OCR and like bike racing, 
is it more like outwardly competitive? Like, do you have any rivals or grudges and like shit talking and stuff like that? Uh, there's like a few people who, um, I wouldn't call it shit, like shit talking, but I would say like, yeah, there's like competitive rivalry, but also like, I just don't care at all. I'm just like, <laughs> going to show up and race and like do my thing and then going to go home. Um, yeah, nothing's really going to change, uh, change that. I think So you're a lot of people maybe a lot of people maybe see me as like a rival or like they might not like me or really want to beat me or something like that. But I just, yeah, I don't, I, I've been racing for so long and like, I just, yeah, I just don't care. <laughs> I just want to like do the best I can do that day. And like, just uh, if I can like run a race really well and I'll be happy. so you're pretty internally motivated it sounds Yeah, totally. are there any athletes in our sport that you pay close attention to or you follow because you find them interesting Um, yeah, I mean, somewhat. I think that, like, everyone who I've, like, had, um, I guess infatuation wouldn't be the right word, but, like, uh, a lot of people that I've, like, thought were... cool or inspiring or whatever i've like come to like meet them or like learn things about them that have like soured the process and so Oh no. yeah, there's there's like there's people i follow that i think are like cool or really good athletes but at the end of the day i think like humanity and humans are just like so flawed that it's it's hard to hold anyone on a pedestal for too long It's true, man. It's, it's, it's anticlimactic sometimes to like for me to be there on uh, UTMB race week to meet all my heroes and likewise for them to meet the lowly podcaster that's interviewed them from time to time. But, uh, now that's interesting, man. Um, are you a coach too? So like in, you mentioned that like you have like the Airbnb stuff and you're, you do some Yeah. coaching on the side as well. Yeah. So, um, my, uh, like I'm my mental coach and I both set up like a, uh, a training platform called box coaching, which is no excuses coaching. And, um, it's a little bit different from most, most coaching platforms in that it's kind of like more of a, it's more of like a pathway to learning how to self coach than like an actual, um, like do this, do that. Oh, So interesting. we have this, like, we have this online platform kind of like similar to a Facebook where people can go on and um, talk about their experiences and things like that. Um, I also post three levels of training each week, like a high, medium, and a low, like, training block. Um, but I really, like, try to, I try to teach the athletes to, like, to go on there and use that as, like, a framework and then... through like introspection hopefully create their own like path towards um towards excellence and it's kind of like i just basically asked myself when i was starting what would i have found most helpful and it it's not having someone to say run eight miles today run six miles today do intervals today it's having someone say You could probably run eight miles today, and this is the reason why. But if you feel like you should do something else, maybe look into that and then, like, reach out to me and ask me. And then, like, maybe I'll suggest something differently or you have a goal coming up. And then we, like, kind of create this uh, this destiny. <laughs> I've never heard of a coaching business model where the goal is to graduate the athlete out of the process and to be self-sustaining. That's really interesting. Exactly. And that's kind of, it's kind of ironic, but it's also, I don't think there's a lot of coaches, coach athlete relationships that last for more than a few years because eventually the athlete either thinks they know enough or thinks that someone else is going to be a better coach or things stagnate. And so I like, I definitely took that into consideration when I was like trying to think of the best way to educate people and to um, coach people. essentially. Before we get into the miscellaneous round of questions, I want to ask you about some of the cool stuff you've done on the Northeast US FKT scene. You've dabbled in the Adirondacks, you've dabbled in the White Mountains, Yeah. you've done some pretty cool stuff. Um, 
Is there anything in that scene that is inspiring you particularly right now to go after, maybe invest some time in? Yeah, um, I'd like to take back the presidential traverse from, I think Jack has it now. Uh, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, I would like to go after the New Hampshire 48 record. I have the Adirondack 46 record. Um, so yeah, doing like the New Hampshire, all the high peaks in New Hampshire. And then maybe um, I'd like to do, there's like a bike run link up in Vermont where you like bike between the the 4,000 foot peaks and you run them. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, I think FKT is that like bike run combos um, would be like exciting for me um, because like biking is a strength of mine. Uh, what else in the Northeast? Yeah, I think, and and then like yeah, like the classic um, Penny Traverse would be really cool. Are you somebody that would ever be interested in like these like multi multi day FKTs like the Long Trail or the Appalachian Trail or the PCT stuff like that? Well, long trail is what three and a half days, um, which yeah. is like about how long it took me to do the forty six er. I I was like actually trying to get to Vermont during COVID to do that. Oh, really? Because um, the long trail starts like ten miles from where I live, um, so that's definitely on the list. As far as like the AT PCT month plus long stuff, it's something I've never tried. I've done the adventure races lasted for seven days. Um, which always went really well. Um, but as far as like a month long commitment, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, in a couple years. Yeah. It seems like the trend among like, at least the athletes in our sport is if you're going to go do a long trail, like a long, long trail FKT, it's typically like the swan song of your career. Like you're like in your mid to late forties about to retire. And like, you totally. know that no matter what happens, it's going to waste you and you weren't going to win another race anyways. Although I don't know, there's one, one guy, Joe McConaughey, who is definitely like a leader in that area right now. And yeah. he, he still stays fresh and he's, you know, relatively young. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Um, I was uh, super interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but also I think like more, more things that are more adventurous, um, where you're like, I'd like to do some more stuff in like any, in the Arctic or, um, things that are like more like point to point, like either historical or just really logical, cool routes. Uh, AT PCT seems cool, but it's also like a bit of a hiking highway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you, you've been alluding to it like the whole episode, but, um, like there's a video on YouTube. I'm not sure if you've watched it. I'll link to it in the show notes. Anton Krupichka uh, doing the Longs Peak Triathlon out in Boulder where you start on a bike, then you run, and then you're doing mm -hmm. a little bit of scrambling, climbing to the top of Longs Peak. And uh, it'd be cool to see like that become more popular because, again, it just combines so many different disciplines, different motivations, skill sets. Totally. I feel like someone like you, that's like right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah, I would love to do that and like things like that. Um, yeah, FKTs are so cool. And I mean, I think the whole premise of them is kind of like becoming a little commercialized and that's like a bit of a bummer, but, um, yeah, there's just like, you can do so much more when there's no, you know, regulations or road closures or permissions that you have to get and just go run something amazing and then, uh, make it competitive. Okay, I got to ask you something there because you said something interesting. At, at what point do you think all of this outside influence in the FKT scene, like, I don't know, like what outside magazine has done acquiring the fastest known time website? At what point do you think that becomes like too involved and the scene is no longer as compelling, maybe free as it was before, as you preferred it? I think it's already becoming that way. I think that there's this trend in FKTs of just like, creating random meaningless FKTs just to pad people's stats. And I think it's like, I think it's really lame because like what drew me to FKTs was just like the, just how amazing the roots were. It's like, they're like gems of the area. And so, and now it's just like, here's my FKT of going up and down my driveway. It's kind of like, it, it just it just goes so against it and i realize that like we're about this 
kind of culture of inclusion and I'm all for that, but I'm like, I'm against, uh, I'm against inclusion to the point where it like dil dilutes, like the amazingness of what FTTs are and could be and should be. It's mm. kind of like if you were to make, say like you have the triple crown of like long distance hiking three trails and they're all amazing in their own rights. But what if people just started adding to the, that list of trails? It's yeah. like there isn't another AT or PCT out there. So it's like to just make stuff up just for the fact, just for like the commercialism and like uh, ego boosting yeah. that it is, is just sad. And it, and it like, it means that like people like me, like, like whatever it was, I don't know, six years ago when I started doing FKTs, I would go to an area and I would look up the FKT and I would say, oh my God, there's this route. It's amazing. And then I would go run it and maybe get the FKT, maybe not, but it was like an amazing experience because the route was so iconic and so cool. Mm. But now, like if that was me today, I would go and look up and there'd be like 50 routes in that area and I would just pick one and then it wouldn't be the same experience because it's like, it's not like one of those things to do in the area it's just like something that someone made up yeah I, I think i agree with a lot of what you're saying there doesn't doesn't the current fkt website try to distinguish like what are the most important legit fkts in each region like if you go to like the northeast section um you'll see at the top 10 that they think are like on a pedestal and then everything else has just been you know user generated and maybe not as uh meaningful right but I think there's a lot more than like 10 FKTs in North America that are like cool. True. So like, yeah, yeah. I think they call them like the gold, golds. I don't know what the term they use, but they have some term <laughs> yeah. for, uh, for like their like super awesome roots. Um, and I think there's only five or six or seven of them. And it's really weird. Cause they're like, I think they're all in the U S which is like kind of weird. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, there's a lot more than five or six amazing routes that have history and have legitimacy. Um, I think they should just like keep FKTs like the way it was, have like only the best ones, ones that like make sense logistically uh, are like historic or like super amazing. And then everything else should just get wiped off. And then mm. they, if they want to have people going after, like make age groups or something, make like an age group FKT or like whatever. Um, so like now you can say like, oh, I was the fastest 50 to six year old to do this. That means like everybody can like go and do the FKTs and like have an amazing time and post fast times and challenge themselves. But there isn't going to be, yeah, like out double out and back infinity loop of like whatever it's just like it is it is well cool i wanted to make sure we touched on that before uh <laughs> we got to the rapid fire round and, I, and man i appreciate you because i know i've been all over the place with questions and asked a ton of basic stuff but um you just came on my radar so i had to do it uh <laughs> okay yeah so i appreciate the flexibility um first question i have for you in the rapid fire round what is the best advice you've ever received I think the best advice I've ever received was someone telling me that like, no matter what I do at a race, that I'll still be loved and I'll still be, you know, appreciated. And I think ever since then, I've just like not gotten nervous about racing or about mm. competing because it's like kind of puts everything in perspective. Mm. Like, so yeah, the advice would be no matter how you do in an event, like your value or worth as a human, um, and like to those who love you isn't going to change. What is something that you used to believe strongly earlier in your career that you have recently changed your mind about? Hmm. I used to believe strongly in, uh, like, I guess periodization and like overly specific training. And I've kind of, changed my mind somewhat in the realm of mental state, motivation, um, human factors, uh, life factors, just so many things come into play and disrupt, um, 
our best intentions of creating this like ideal training plan and it just doesn't exist what is the best book movie or podcast you have consumed recently uh that you think the audience would uh enjoy hearing about i really like the trainer road podcast it's like a cycling podcast where they kind of talk about training and stuff and um it's just like consistently good so I'd say check cool. that one out We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, last question. If you could put a message on a billboard for all to see, what would it say and why? Uh, spend more time outside. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain it. Uh, we'll make sure to link to all of your social media in the show notes, everything you mentioned in the rapid fire there too. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Great to get to know you. Uh, I'm formerly from the Northeast, so I, I love having these types of conversations as well. That's right. Um, <laughs> And uh, anything you want to leave the audience with or anything you want to say before we go? Uh, no, I apologize to you for being so hard to finally pin down with my insane, insane last few days. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about the passport debacle in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. For, <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, I had my, my wife and I had our passports and a bunch of our gear stolen. We were down in Mexico for a race and we had brought... Uh, a bunch of climbing gear to climb uh, El Pico to Orizaba afterwards. Someone broke into a rental car while we were racing and wiped us out pretty good. So, yeah, then we had to get home and that was quite hard. Right on. Well, uh, we'll have to have you on the podcast again uh, when you decide to go all in on UTMB one of these upcoming years. Sweet. Sounds good. All right. Peace, brother.